solutions to our debt crisis. Plus, great moments in humility. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie saying, quote, I already know I could win the White House. Does pride goeth before the fall? Plus, Charlie Sheen's America. Like it or not, his story is the talk of the nation. What it says about him and about us. The show starts right now. Now to the sideshow that is the budget battle in Washington. Senate Democrats today helping to pass the House GOP bill to keep the government running for another two weeks. That, of course, sets up the next showdown. We appear to be lurching from one month to two weeks, and I don't know what's next. We've got to stop spending money that we don't have on more government and calling that progress. We cannot continue to go in the direction we're going. Will we, in fact, try to balance the budget on the back on the backs of the middle class, on the backs of the poor, on the backs of the elderly, the sick, the children. That is the question. Mark your calendars. March 18th, that's when the money runs out again. Between now and then, another partisan clash over a teeny tiny piece of the budget called, quote, domestic discretionary spending. All just a warm up for yet another threatened government shutdown when the debt limit is reached next month. What a fine example of democratic self-governance we're setting for the rising Arab world. The hoax, of course, is that with both parties keeping the biggest chunks of federal spending off limits in these fights, I'm talking about defense, Medicare and Medicaid, and even Social Security, which gives billions each year to well-off families that don't need it, the cuts fall instead on things like nutrition for poor women and children or Big Bird, which do nothing to address the $1.5 trillion deficit problem we face. Instead, our fearless leaders think these cuts will send a signal that they're serious about getting serious someday. Are you receiving that signal, America? Meanwhile, no one is talking about taking on our medical industrial complex, which gives us health care for double the cost of every other rich nation. Or about asking Wall Street's zillionaires to pitch in with higher tax rates that wouldn't affect their lifestyles or productive economic activity at all. All of which raises the question, how dumb do our leaders think we are? Are these bipartisan charades a case of good people trapped in a dysfunctional process? Or does Washington's fear of dealing with reality simply hold up a mirror to our own collective state of denial? Joining us now are two assuredly decent men trapped in a mad political system none of us seem to be able to escape. Democratic Caucus Vice Chair Javier Becerra, who voted against the spending extension. He was also a member of the President's Deficit Commission. And from the GOP, Congressman Phil Gingry, who voted for the budget extension and also introduced two bills to drastically reduce spending caused by the unions. Congressman Becerra, let me start with you. Uh, two weeks at a time, is this really what it's uh, come down to? Is this any way to run uh, the greatest nation on earth? Matt, it's a mad, mad world when two weeks is considered a reprieve. And uh, if I were to talk to the local hardware store back home and ask them, can you budget on a two-week uh, basis, they'd say, are you kidding? If people want to order paint, they want to order hardware supplies. I can't tell them that. This is crazy. But this is what happens when you, for 58 days, for two months, you put up a budget that everyone knew was dead on arrival. And then at the end of the day, your bluff is called and you're left with very little time to do something. So I'm hoping that we go beyond this and get to the real work now. Congressman Gingrey, is that, uh, is, is that how you see it, or is this a victory, as many in the GOP seem to think? Well, I would agree with my colleague from California that it is a bizarro world up here, but maybe for a little bit different reasons. We see it a little bit differently. Uh, quite honestly, it was the Democratic majority which fa failed to pass any of the spending bills. Indeed, didn't even have a budget uh, for the 2011 fiscal year. And that's why we're in the mess that we're in right now. Uh, I don't like two-week extensions. Heck no. In H.R. 1, we voted for a seven-month extension and $61 billion worth of cuts. And I think that is fiscal responsibility. But here's, here's why I think Americans get frustrated. You've got a two-week extension that you all have just come together to do. We're going to have the same showdown in two weeks. There's already slated to be another uh, game of chicken with the debt limit, which looks like it's around mid-April. It seems like there's no end in sight to what, uh, honestly, just seems like no way to run a government. Congressman Becerra, what, what do you see as the path past this? 
man, I think we got to stop playing Russian roulette. You can only do it so many times before you get hurt. And at this stage, Democrats have already put forward a budget that would have cut, what well, did cut, $41 billion from what the president had requested in his fiscal year budget. This two-week extension did four more, mostly to schools, I thought was the wrong way to do it. We can sit down, come up with a uh, bill that tries to get us closer to balancing our budgets, but without harming the investments that we want to make for our schools, for our firefighters, for our police officers, this budget went deep. It took out border enforcement money. It took out money for cops on the beat. It did things that when people see them, if they were ever to become law, people would wonder, is it really that mad a world up in Washington, D.C.? Yet, Congressman Gingry, uh, I mean, is there an end game that the GOP has? Is this all, it seems like it's being improvised day to day, and maybe that's the nature of a showdown like this, but it's not very reassuring. You know, the Republicans talked a lot about wanting to have certainty for world markets. Now you've got all the stuff going on in the Middle East, and now you've got stuff at home where it looks like we're running ourselves like a banana republic. What's your end game uh, that you and John Boehner see for, yeah. for bringing this to something that will at least put this year behind us so you can fight about the, you know, the long term? Well, Matt, clearly here you cannot have any sacred cows. And what we have to remember uh, is that all of this spending was plussed up. Uh, if you count the economic stimulus package that was uh, passed, what, $862 billion, much of that went to domestic spending, not to shovel-ready projects. So we're, we're talking about cutting from a very bloated level. And, and so there are no sacred cows, and that's why my bill uh, H.R. 122, the Federal Employee Responsibility Act, would say to uh, our federal employees who are unionized, who collective bargain, uh, we're not in the bill taking away that right to collective bargaining. We're just simply saying, uh, not on the taxpayer's dime. Uh, you give us eight hours worth of work a day. That's what you're uh, you're signed on to do. That's what you owe the taxpayer, and let the union pay for the time that you spend arbitrating and and, and uh, mediating and whatever other union activities you do during a typical Con Con day. Congressman, let me stop you there for a second because I, I understand what you're trying to do with, the, uh, with some union reforms, and that's obviously a big theme around the country now, but you talked about sacred cows. Let's talk about Medicare. I mean, that, that's the piece of the budget that no one is talking about along with Medicaid, Social Security, defense, and taxes as part of the equation. You're a doctor yourself. Doctor payments, doctors in the United States make a lot more than doctors do overseas, which is one of the big reasons we have health care costs that are twice as much per capita as any other advanced nation on earth. Are you ready to put the medical industrial complex on the table? And specifically, what in that sacred cow are you willing to take on? Well, absolutely. And there are a number of things. Of course, my bill, H.R. 5, is on, on medical liability reform. Thank goodness. No, 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 no. no. Li li liability reform is not the answer. I'm talking about the compensation that doctors get, the reimbursements that hospitals get. The big bulk of health care spending, as you know, is in those categories. We can agree. Let's put medical liability reform aside. I'm with you. We need to do tort reform. Obamacare should have done that. Right. Let's, let's stipulate that. What are you going to go after in terms of doctor and hospital reimbursement, the stuff where your constituencies will not be happy? Where's your courage on that? Well, I stand strong. Let me tell you, I took this job in Congress for the pay raise. Uh, uh, doc doctors were already taking cuts in Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement to the point that they couldn't even keep the lights on. Uh, and it's only going to get worse, uh, particularly with this maintenance of effort requirement But you know, that, you, you know that average that physician fees and income in the U.S. is much higher than it is in the rest of the world. Do you, do well, you, do you acknowledge that? Uh, all I know is that uh, average primary care physicians, uh, 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 general internists, uh, family practitioners probably make around $165,000 a year, and they work about 80 hours a week. Now, if, if, if anybody begrudges that to physicians, then I'm telling you they're just flat wrong. We're not going to have any physicians like that great doctor in the emergency room out in Tucson that saved our colleague's life because uh, we're about to kill the goose that laid the the golden egg and having the federal government literally take over the entire process. We're going to lose the best and brightest. Understood. Congressman Becerra, let me give you a last, uh, uh, since, since, I, since I went back and forth so much, give me a last quick word uh, on what, what you make of what uh, Congressman Gingrey has said and where this debate's going to head in the next couple of weeks. Matt, have you ever seen a politician 
who will point the finger at anyone but himself or herself when it comes to the problems and overspending. Uh, we do nothing. There's a $32,000 refrigerator in a Pentagon Air Force plane or a plane with the Pentagon as $32,000. I could buy them a refrigerator for $2,000 and it'd be great. Uh, the Pentagon still hasn't gotten money back from Halliburton for charging for meals to our soldiers in Iraq that it never served. And so there's a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse we can go after. The Republican budget doesn't touch defense one cent. And so we can do things to go after those sacred cows, but we can't do it this way, and certainly not for two weeks at a time. All right, gentlemen, obviously we're going to have to come back to this, and we will be because the issue is not going away, and the government shutdowns and the threats of them aren't going away. We'll talk to you again. Coming up here on the Dylan Radigan Show, a provocative view of Barack Obama. Is he too passive? Is he too often MIA on big issues? Is this, in fact, a Where's Waldo presidency? We'll mix it up. Plus, Chris Christie brags that he could win the White House. If that's true, why aren't you running, big guy? What can you do with plain mashed potatoes? When you pour chunky beef with country vegetable soup over it, you can do dinner. Four minutes, around four bucks. Campbell's Chunky, it's amazing what soup can do. If you believe